All right, well, it's just gone 7.30. We've got a few people still joining, but we can get started. So let me uh, share my screen here. Let's see, share, share. Okay. It should have gone to a shared screen. It did. Can you see it? I can. Yay. All right. Um, so we got a, a full agenda tonight. Um, we've got uh, Art Clark is going to present the, the main topic for us tonight on solid state transformers. Um, got a few other usual things that we, we talk about. And Tom's going to give us an update of what we're planning for our modified field day for this year as well. So. Uh, we'll cover all the usual stuff first, and then we'll move on to our, our main couple of topics at the end. Uh, so, Phil, do you want to do the usual club membership and treasury updates? Certainly. Uh, we've had, in the past couple of days, three additional paid members, two of which are new members. So the head count is currently 127 members, and the ARRL percentage is 65.32. And uh, did you want the treasury at this point as well? Sure, okay. Uh, currently the balance is $8,917.89, of which 3449.96 is in the repeater fund. And along with that, I would like to, to make a motion that uh, we uh, denote Mr. Paul Gross as a lifetime honorary member because he's done so darn many good things and he's been ensconced in his uh, little retirement home nobody lets him out so uh, we might just as well give him an award he can't receive personally <laughs> and i'll let you run the voting operation side of that kevin but i think this is very long overdue He's a most deserving recipient, and uh, the club owes him a great deal. Okay, do we want to vote? We just want to do a thumbs up. Look at that. Well, two thumbs up, because Hank says okay. yes, too. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I think that's a resounding yes. Hey, Paul, you'll have to print up your own certificate. <laughs> Yeah. You know, I have I have some material. Maybe I should uh, avail myself of it, eh? <laughs> Did you ever get that stuff to work? Oh, we got we've gotten so wrapped up in doing things that need to be done around here, and then I, you know, and then you get to the evening and you go cross-eyed. You're not going to do fool stuff like that. You know how that goes. So, and I forget about it. <laughs> so. Thank you, everyone. That's quite an honor. I really appreciate it. Well, and you really deserve it. Yeah. It's high time. You've waited all this time, Paul. <laughs> all right. Very well deserved. All right. Moving on. Uh, anything else, Phil? Are you done? Uh, that covers my issues. All right. All right. Well, at least my issues for the, for the net tonight. Yeah, we don't want to hear about anything else. That's okay. The other issues are way too interesting. You can keep that to yourself. <clears throat> All right. Here we uh, have issues with, with golf. <laughs> Cal, do we yeah, have a that's a That's a worthy discussion. <laughs> Cal, do we have a club website update tonight? Uh, I'll just, um, if you can come back to me, I'm going to have to reboot the computer because it's locked up, okay? I'll be back okay. in just about two minutes. Sure. Okay. All right. Um, the next topic we wanted to bring up, we, we had an idea that we wanted to put together some cheat sheets to help with programming your handy talkies. And we were collecting uh, a few articles together and links to videos and posts and things. But we thought it might be a good idea if we just poll the group here and ask, like, what do you actually have? Like, what make and model of handy talkie do you have? What do you most recently use? Um, if you've got hundreds, we don't want to see like a whole big list of hundreds of them, but tell us like what's the main make and models that you've got. And the way we thought we'd do it is down in the chat window, like rather than trying to do a, a round table and taking half an hour to get through everybody, 
if you can just click the chat button down at the bottom and then just type in your make and model of your like your most commonly used handy talky or um, like the one that you need most help programming with and then what we'll try and do is we'll get together some like quick cheat sheet references and we'll get them collected together and put them up on the club website so you can start mm -hmm. pinging in those down in the chat window there and then i'll collect a, a list at the end of the meeting so we'll do that um, is there any other board member updates or any other updates from anyone else before we move on to our main topic tonight? So, uh, yes, we'd like to have a drink out. And, um, because no? Okay, all right. Um, we'll hand it over to Art with our main topic tonight on solid state transformers. I'm going to leave. Uh, thanks, gentlemen. The phone's ringing. It's for my wife. I'll be, uh, just give me a, a second, please. Okay, sure. And I'll leave the. Uh, uh, let's take a look what's going on in our handy talkie list. Then we've got some Yesus and we've got some Bofangs. And I didn't actually know how to spell Bofang. I made a. <laughs> Is there a way to save this? Hey, hey guys, yeah, that, I got it. My wife picked up. Uh, for those that have been interested in the show me the shack topic. Uh, we had seven people that uh, responded, and uh, we were thinking of doing that for the next general meeting, which is in July. And uh, we would like to make you presenters, so we may be in this kind of situation uh, next, next month, but we'll see if it goes a little smoother. Maybe we can do some practice. Low voltage electronics and household wiring. This is kind of like a warning to please play pay close attention to the details. <laughs> Our wiring has been pretty much the same for about 80 years. Um, it's 120 volts or around that, 60 cycle AC current. It's been the standard of North America and most of South America with the exception of some areas of Brazil, Chile and Argentina. <clears throat> now, if you have a low voltage electronics, it means that careful attention must be paid to transformers, dimmers, appliances, and the wiring. It, it will not tolerate mistakes and work correctly. Okay, change the slide, uh, Kevin, please. Okay. Next slide. Okay, now in my particular house, <clears throat> I had these. Uh, 12 volt rail lights. They were popular about 20 years ago. They're, uh, they're totally insanely expensive when, they're, when they came out. Each one of those lights retail was about $240. Okay, now just so, just so if, you're, if you're curious, you can go to Home Depot, get something that's almost the same thing for about $25 now. Yeah, now if you look yeah. on the ceiling, that you got it covered, brown. though, Art. Oh, go ahead. You got it covered because you said my wife absolutely loves them. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't matter how expensive they are. She loves them. Okay. And that if you look at the if you look at the ceiling, the very top of that picture, off to the left is a big well, non, that that's a that's a support. That that is the transformer that transforms the 120 volt 60 cycle AC to 12 volt 60 cycle DC. Now that's a magnetic transformer. And these, what you're looking at now, are um, halogen bulbs. Okay, next slide, click. Okay, now I want to change these, slot, these, these bulbs to LEDs because each one of those four ones was 45 watts. The new ones would be five watts. It's hot in the summer. 45 watts, so they're very expensive to use. So I replaced all four of the bulbs, of the halogen bulbs, with 12 volt dim dimmable LEDs from Amazon, of course. The lighting was great, but the humming drove me nuts. Now, what went wrong? Okay, next slide. Okay, this, let me give you a little bit more background. That transformer, I had a 12 volt magnetic transformer. It was encased in around housing. 
It weighs about 20 pounds. It costs about $450 to replace. Jeez. It works great with halogens, but it is not compatible with 12 volt dimmable LED lights. Mm. The, the waveform just won't work with it. But, if, but that's the cool thing about making mistakes in our great hobby. Not just um, ham radio, but you know, households itself. Because you go on these really, really great adventures of learning. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, now, so I went to the lighting store up on um, Auburn Boulevard, across the street from the uh, dart and pool supply, pool, you know, game supply place, and I bought a 12 volt. LED electronic transformer for AC. Now these things are really, really cool. They're smaller than a pack of cards, bigger than a pack of, of, like, of, 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 of like a wooden matchbox. They're extremely lightweight. You have probably two ounces at that. About 25 bucks. What's not to like about them? You know, and this is what those big old transformers that you saw with those big old expensive 45 watt halogen lights are being transformed into LEDs using transformers of this nature. Okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> now, this is one of the things which I also learned the hard way. A 12 volt electronics transformer requires a low voltage electronic dimmer. A tra electronic transformer needs an electronic dimmer. It looks like any other dimmer that you can get at the Home Depot, but the difference is instead of about 15 bucks, they're around 80 bucks. And the back of this dimmer has four wires, black for hot or the line voltage, white or the neutral voltage, green or the ground, and yellow or the load. Now, most dimmers only have two or three wires. Next, next slide, please. Okay, my result was flickering lights. I did not pay attention to the line and the load wiring. I read the directions, but I was on autopilot because I have a contractor's license. I've re replaced hundreds of, of lights in my day. And I've installed lots of switches. But guess what? The dimmer did not care about my experience. <laughs> so what I have to say is take the time to determine where the black wires in your electrical box go. Modern electronics demand proper alignment. And I was just really fortunate that the dimmer has a, a forgiving nature and I didn't ruin the $80 thing, which ha has happened before doing different things. Okay, next slide, please. So this is, this is the basically what we have in our houses. This is what's been, we've had for like around 1960. We have 12-2 Romex wire. The black is the hot, the white is the neutral, and the bare wire is the ground. Old school single pole switches, which I replaced, many of you have replaced, will work with either black wire, the, the black wire going to the light or the black wire going to the source. You can switch them around. The switch doesn't care. It just makes contact. The light goes on. Everything's cool. But it's a different story when it comes to electronic dimmers. Next slide, please, Kevin. Okay. The fix was read and follow the directions. Okay. I've already gone over green is for ground. That's the first bullet. Connect the red dimmer to the wire leading to the circuit breaker. That's called the line, okay? The next one down is connect the yellow dimmer wire to the wire leading to the load. Now, for those of you who um, are unsure, because like in my case, I took the cover plate off, removed the old dimmer, <clears throat> took it out, and guess what? If you see a bunch of black wires, how are you going to know which one's line and which one's load? You might have to go out to your circuit breaker box and turn it on again. Be very careful and then connect up your, uh, your, your voltmeter to it. Okay, but that has to be determined. 
Let's go on to the next one. Connect the white dimmer wire. No, 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 I'm sorry, go back, back one, I'm sorry. There we go, okay, I meant the next bullet. Okay, I'm sorry, my mistake. Connect the white dimmer wire to the neutral. Now, a lot of dimmers don't have a, a neutral wire, but this one, because it's an electronic dimmer, needs the current from the household to actually work and dim. Okay, then the last one is connect the red dimmer wire. Oh, oh I'm sorry, this last one is that if you have an extra one, if, 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 if you're not on a three-way one, you don't connect it. That, that one you sometimes leave blank. Now look at the notes at the bottom. The wire location will vary by product, color, and location. You have to determine some of them might have a black when they mean red or a red when back. Read this number two. If the red and the yellow wires are reversed, the lamp may flicker. Duh! Take the time to read the directions. Okay, again, you know, you look right at it and it's so easy to just go on autopilot. Hey, I've done this millions of times. It, it will work. Okay. Next, next slide, please. Okay, the result was everything works as it should, and my marriage is still intact. And now I'm going to have a, one little confession to make, and that is, and I'll get into it more with the, the next with the next slide, is that occasionally these four um, lights will flicker, and they'll flicker because I've got lots of dimmers all over the house. And it's, even though they say it's okay for just one electronic dimmer, just the fact that you're dealing with LEDs and different dimmers and stuff, you sometimes do get a little uh, flickering, but that's unusual. Most of the time, and I'm, what I mean by most of the time is 98% of the time is fine. Uh, next slide, please. Yep. Yeah, uh, uh, okay, good. Now. I want to go over this one because this will really throw you off. I've, this slide is called Other Squirrely Stuff. When you're dealing with electronic dimmer, uh, electronic transformers, very, very important. Many, if not most, electronic transformers need a small load in order to even turn on. For, and as an example, a voltmeter will read zero when measuring from blank light sockets. If all of your four of those light sockets were blank and I turned on the light switch and I put my voltmeter in there thinking that I'm gonna check my work, you go, oh my gosh, I got a bad transformer. You don't have a bad transformer. You need a little bit of a load to make the transformer turn on. And that brings me down to the second bullet. Don't buy an electronic transformer with too much power. In my own case, I bought a 60 watt transformer. Now I could have bought like a 150 watt transformer, but that'd be asking for trouble and here's why. <clears throat> Your load has to be of a certain size in order to switch the transformer on. In, in my case, about 15%. So if I have a 60 watt transformer and 20 watts of of load, no problem at all. So you have to check your power requirements before buying. You don't want to buy a, a transformer with too little power, but you also have to be aware that too much power could be a problem too. Read the fine print before purchasing. Now here's another one. Okay, many electronic transformers produce a square sine wave. That's how they work. Uh, the reason you get dimmer is that square sine wave, the top part increases over time and that gives you like a brighter light or decreases over time. And that gives you a dimmer light. And, they were, and these, and these uh, transformers will require an analog voltmeter. Most digital voltmeters will read zero voltage even though it's working perfectly. Hmm. The last one is also important. Only one electronic dimmer per circuit. If I had more LEDs with more electronic, you know, more electronic dimmers, it wouldn't, yeah, I'd be asking for trouble. More than one dimmer on one circuit will likely cause flickering. So you have to really plan carefully before starting a project. And I think we're just gonna see more and more of this because 
we have wiring that is basically the model is 80 years old, but that doesn't mean the, te the technology stands still. All of our home entertainment with is going to be, a, in my opinion, in a couple of years, set for like a 12 volt um, setup. And we're going to have to just be aware of those transformers. I think we're just going to see more and more of them. Just like most of our HF rigs are powered by a 12 volt power supply, I think we're going to see more and more of that with our widescreen TVs going into our computers, going into our cell phones. Anyway, thank you for your patience. I hope you learned something. I know I did. And that's the cool thing about our hobby. You know, you, you're always learning something. So thank you very much for, uh, for, for hearing me out. And Kevin, you know, go ahead and, uh, and, and return to the regular screens. Okay. Cool. Thanks, Arthur. Do you have Arthur. any questions for us? Yeah, if you have any questions. Well, I, I'd like to make a comment. Can you hear me? Sure. Um, yep. What's going on there, can, the halogen lamps he's talking about, they're the little MR16s, right, Art? I you know, think so, had yeah. A little reflector-based two-prong right. lamps for your fixtures. They're an incandescent lamp. And all incandescent lamps, the dimming technique is you chop part of the sine wave off at the start and how much you chop off determines the dimming rate. Incandescent lamps are a voltage controlled device. LEDs, most of you probably know, are a current controlled device. And that little tiny transformer you put in there is actually a switch mode power supply. And so there's been uh, enormous amounts of money spent, in, spent on research into how to properly dim LEDs in an AC system with a switch mode power supply and also how to dim LEDs in an AC system with an incandescent power supply. So there's a whole variety of different dimming options available out there and the marriage of the two sometimes is not perfect. Mm -hmm. So Art did the right thing in uh, in aligning the stars so that his system would work. And any poor soul that goes down that path is gonna make the same discovery. So, uh, you know, I spent 40 years selling that kind of stuff and I've got all the scars to prove it. <laughs> Art, this is Neil, uh, good evening. Thanks for a good presentation. Uh, any problems with the RF uh, noise? And uh, because we have all kinds of uh, RF noises here uh, when we buy some of those uh, wall plugs. Any problems that you found or any recommendation? No, no, I, no, it's in, in that sense, it's been seamless. Uh, yeah, we watch our TV every night. Uh, I use my radio every day. I, I, I haven't picked up that kind of home. Most of my problems with RF come from outside the home. Thank you. Any other questions? Tom, uh, a comment actually. Okay. At last year's Pacificon, there was a topic on that very subject with dimmers and a neighbor's uh, LED system. They left it on all the time and it was a constant noise source for them. Uh, he offered to go over and help them fix it, but that never got to work. He eventually moved away. And while he was moved, uh, the, that neighbor came over and then tried to fix all the lights before the next owner would come along and, and take over and, and use them again. So that was an interesting topic. <laughs> I mean, go cool figure. <laughs> so that I was know, my I, I, I know. I'm, I'm real, you know, I'm very fortunate in my neighborhood. Uh, you know, I don't have HOAs. Uh, my neighbors who know that I'm a ham radio operator are uh, mostly very curious. <laughs> And, uh, and my antennas don't seem to be seen from the road. So I, I'm good, I'm lucky. All right, thanks. Uh, I'm glad you, it worked out well. I was wondering, after all doing that, you would have new noise sources, so it, it worked out great. No, no, I'm, I'm really lucky uh, in, you know, in that sense. I also, have a, I also have a pacemaker that doesn't give me any trouble from my radio stuff. So in a lot of ways, I'm good. <laughs> That's a plus right there. <laughs> God, yeah. Evans, yes. All right. Hmm. Any more questions? This is Bob, K6GCN. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. 
Um, I was going through, uh, thumbing through some old CQ magazines, and ironically, I came across an article that almost is right on topic. Uh, and I can refer this to you guys if, if you're interested. It would be in July 2017, CQ magazine, page 34. And uh, it was, the title of the, the topic is Seeing the Light Dimly, Controlling COB, uh, which stands for um, Chips on Board, COB LED Lamps. And interestingly enough, uh, they were talking about the load problem and what, what they did in this article is actually put a couple of resistors so that there's a permanent load in the circuit. And what they used in this case happened to be um, two watt, 22K, they, they parallel two 22K resistors, uh, two watts each to provide that load. Uh, but if you want additional reading, uh, CQ Magazine, July 2017. It's a great follow-on to uh, your topic tonight, which was excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, it's just, uh, yeah, yeah, these are modern times, and we're going to see more and more of this. So all I can say is just please uh, do your homework. Uh, you, you'll have a great time learning and meeting new people at the way at the different stores and stuff. And, uh, and in the end, you have chances are you're going to be fine. I've got a question, Art and Bob. Uh, the article you mentioned, Bob, with the yes. resistors, uh, uh, does that imply that you can get the dimmer down to a lower level uh, for the light, um, that there's enough current being drawn that it can run at a very low. Yes. Yeah, that, that's the uh, implication in the article. Providing that permanent load uh, on the lamps allows you to, to go through the full control of dimming uh, from totally dim or off all the way to full brightness. Perfect. That's good to know. Great presentation, Art. Thank you. I hey, thank you, guys. I really do appreciate it. I'm happy to do it. Does anyone know why the, uh, the, the switching power supply works when a magnetic transformer doesn't for this application? They both work. <clears throat> they, they both work, but it's, it's the compatibility issue. For current control devices, I use a pulse width modulated control signal to affect dimming. For an well, incandescent got, load, you use a chopped sine wave approach, two right, different but, control technologies. But we've got uh, two different components here. We've got the so-called electronic transformer or power supply, and we've got but, the But they're not, they're not a transformer. They're a switch mode I, power supply. I know. They're a switch mode power supply. As, that's one, one component. And then as I understood it, the other component was a separate dimmer. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's correct. You, you have a... The dimmer and the power supply have to be compatible, is, is what, we're, what we're saying. And that, you know, a magnetic dimmer, which I had for that big old transformer in the beginning, worked fine uh, with, with halogen lights, but it would not work with LEDs. Because it's just, as Phil said, you know, the chop mode, the, you know, the, the control it's just totally different. I, 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 again, a lot I don't know. Maybe and there's too much inductance coming really from the transformer. What, 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 what you have to be sure of is that the, this, this solid state transformer per se, or switch mode power supply, is listed as compatible with dimming applications. Not all of them are. So, uh, so here's, here's Here's what I would suggest if you're in a similar situation with lighting. Um, go to one of those lighting places. Like one, the, the one I went to is on uh, Auburn Boulevard, but they have another one on Sunrise. And just go in and explain what you're doing. Like in my case, I had 12 volt magnetic and halogen lights, and they understood exactly the scope of my project. How many do you have for, what is the wattage, are there five watts a piece? Okay, this is what you need. And, and uh, it, it saved me a lot of running around, it saved me a lot of trips, returning stuff to Home Depot, 
or Lowe's or, or Googling on the wrong information, you know, online. So find somebody who knows what they're doing and can steer you in the right direction the first time. All right, any more questions? All right, thanks Art, thanks for the presentation. That was, that was really interesting. Really. I think you muted yourself when you were talking. Well, I wasn't saying yes, that. Thank you, thank you. Okay, <laughs> all right. Uh, okay, Tom, should we move on to the, the field day presentation? Sure, I can give it a try. I, Let me, I, uh, yeah, I'll make you host and then you should be able to present. There we go, yeah. I've not practiced this as well. I, I can say that uh, we were waiting around and waiting around to make sure that we could actually do field day and get more instructions. So uh, Kevin and I uh, were playing over the uh, weekend as computer people and seeing what we could do. So some of the ideas on how we participate all these remote locations is, is by using the internet. So um, if you're gonna set up in your backyard, maybe your Wi-Fi can reach there and maybe that'll be fun. But uh, some of the ideas is, I think the only way we can participate as a team uh, live back and forth is by um, uh, using the internet in some way. Or uh, if you're using your phone, perhaps send a short, short bursts. Otherwise, we're going to maybe people will do paper and pencil and, uh, and log the old fashioned way and set up, I don't know, in your backyard on a table. And if it's not a hot weekend, an umbrella throwing in there too and see how that works. But uh, the idea is that we're not going to our field day site from last year. Um, because it's not open. Uh, the uh, part of the uh, uh, BFW Hall is, is a bar and those aren't really open yet in our, in our area. So let me see if I can do a screen share. Uh, it says desktop, whiteboard, maybe that'll work. Share. Ta-da! Well, yeah, let's see if it opens up and it's still shared. So I'm gonna do this version. Is that seeable? Uh, not yet. We can see your uh, finder. Oh, okay. that's okay. So I need to re-share. How do I escape that? Well, that sucks. Uh, uh, go back down to share screen and then press it again. Yeah, let me go back there. Stop sharing. Let's see. Open it first and then share. <laughs> I know it may cover my screen to do so. Let's, I'll give it a try. So I'm not sharing yet. Let me open it. Oh, I see. And my screen is small, so I got to move stuff around a bit. Ah, there it is. All right, play. And let's see, there I can see it now. That. That. There we go. Ah, uh, but it's not on the big screen yet. So let's try the big screen. Ooh, that's nice. We actually, actually it's uh, it's actually one too far in. Let's see if I can back it up. So the front page is uh, the on your t-shirts that you're gonna get for field day. If you're gonna get t-shirts, it's gonna be this VW van with the antenna on it, and it's gonna say A double R L field day 2020. And so. Uh, it also will include the, the June 27, 28, our normal time for having field day. And let's see if I can progress. And, and that's about me, the R River City Arcs edition of field day modified. It's not a normal field day. And that's me. And if you want to, for some reason, email me, that's my email. So uh, stealing from the AWR website, I made all these slides today, so there might be typos but I stole this, so I think they spelled it correctly. So it's gonna be June 27th and 28th. Field day is always the fourth full weekend of, of June, beginning on 1800 UTC, which in uh, local time is 10 o'clock uh, Saturday morning. And it runs through uh, 
2059 UTC Sunday. Uh, I'll just call that one o'clock Sunday, almost one o'clock Sunday, one minute short. And uh, the bands are gonna be the usual bands. So uh, 160 meters, if you've got a really honking antenna in, that you can set up, uh, depending on where you're setting up. If you're in a field, uh, definitely you might have some room. 80 meters, 40, 20, 15, and 10. And uh, that's for HF and everything else for 50 megahertz and above. So that includes uh, your uh, two meters and your 440 megahertz and, and six meters. And actually I was playing with six meters last year, got one contact. So there was somebody hanging out waiting for me to call them. And uh, <laughs> I put out a CQ and they answered. So we had one six meter contact uh, in our field day setup for HF. Stealing more from the AWR website, uh, the URL to look for field day is you go to the www.arl.org website slash, instead of typing field day all together, they put a hyphen in there this year. So that's the secret if you're not finding it. I bet you can actually find it right on the front page too if you look for it. There are t-shirts for sale, as I said. I think they're blue, just like on that front page. Uh, Sylvia and I haven't looked at them yet, but uh, we might try and get them by the tw 25th, 26th, you know, that weekend. Uh, they're the green. They're green, okay. Well, uh, the ones I stole the image from, it was blue, so maybe that was only a concept. So things have changed. Uh, there's a temporary rule waiver for the 2020 uh, AWRL field, field day. There's some new rules that we can go over. And then there's some topics about the creative approaches to field day 2020. So if you click through those on the actual website, I thought those were the highlights of what you'd probably want to look at. So check those things out. And uh, uh, the rule changes that I kind of skimmed, and I may have typed this wrong or right, is uh, for field day, class D stations, those are stations that are, are home stations, uh, can work other class D stations and, and get points. In previous years, class D stations could work somebody that was out in the field and you would get points for the field person, but you could not actually claim any points for yourself. So because of the pandemic, regular home stations can talk to regular home stations and get points, as well as getting points for any field station that's actually in the field. And see, in addition, uh, for 2020, only an aggregate club score will be published. So um, your individual scores will not win, you, win anything for, the, uh, for yourself as the most points ever if you're a contester, but uh, you can claim uh, your club and those individual people that are working for field day, we can all add our scores together for a super, super total. Uh, so if we're com competing, we'll be competing in a club like N6NA. And so when you post your results, uh, uh, either by typing it in and then sending it or by using your cool software program, uh, please be sure to choose the N6NA team and we'll get it as a team of uh, people who participated and the total will be all added up for our uh, River City Arcs. Those are the main changes for 2020. And uh, I was, stealing all the classes to describe what they are, but I forgot that I didn't add a slide for what our exchange is. And if you would normally do a field day, it's, you know, CQ, CQ, field day, and then your call sign. And normally we would do CQ field day and six NA. And uh, so you're gonna be using your own call signs this year. Uh, you will only have the privileges of your own call sign. So if, uh, if you're a technician, um, well, Sorry, you probably will be working on uh, anything above 50 megahertz. If you have a general, you can work in the general band areas. If you're lucky enough to have uh, somebody that has an extra, you can, uh, and, and using that call sign, you can get the extra privileges so you get a little bit more bandwidth because the bands are super, super tight and busy, especially on the hot bands of 20 meters and 40 meters. So going over the classes, class A is a battery and a club or a non-club group, three or more persons set up specifically for field day. Uh, I think we normally as a club, you know, would be three alpha for three transmitting stations or, or four transmitting stations. I think last year we had four alpha. So we set up four antennas, four, uh, four radios, and then we had 
a pair of uh, people working each station. One was the logger and one was the uh, person handling the radio. And we also last year had a get on the air station. I'm not sure how we're going to do that at home, but I just included it because that's part of the classes. If you're a GOTA, you can know that you are a GOTA station. Uh, and we, those are generally set up for non-hams that, that you get drive by people that are interested in radio and you say, hey, I'll get you on the air. You can use our GOTA station. So I'm not sure the interesting people's thoughts on a GOTA station. I'm not sure how that's working. Uh, I think Kevin and I were, were probably thinking of not going very far from home. I haven't talked to him actually. That'll be an interesting question at the end. Uh, there's another class, class B, which is battery, one or two persons portable, and uh, QRP five watts or less. Non-commercial power, no motor driven things like generators. So there, the reason it's class B, there's actually some points that are better if you're on battery and you have less than five watts and it'll go in a little farther along. And I figured that's too much to put on one slide, so I said class it continued. So um, there is a class C if you're a mobile station in your car driving around somewhere, or you're on your boat because you want to be nautical and you're on Folsom Lake, that would be nice. I'd like to work you actually. Aeronautical, there you go. I've actually, actually talked to people in the air on HF before uh, that are in uh, large jets. And then people powered. I've actually talked to somebody on a bicycle while they were communicating on HF. So um, if you hear class C, that's pretty rare. Uh, make sure make them welcome because I, you know, I don't think I've ever found them on field day. That would be a pretty cool class to note in your logs. Oh, and back to the exchanges. Um, if I was a class C, so I would exchange um, being a one person transmitter, I would be a one Charlie in this case. And if I was in Sacramento, uh, Sacramento Valley, we would give it with the Sugar Victor. So most of us are probably going to be in the Sacramento Valley. So one something probably or two something Sacramento Valley or Sugar Victor is how you'd exchange it. And you, they, they would give you where they're located by their uh, two letter abbreviation and the class they're running. And often, I think the biggest class we had last year was like 16, uh, 16 alpha, which is some ridiculously large group of people. And uh, I tried to email them after the fact saying, how, how did they do that? And, and they said, we did it quite well, but they didn't actually say how they could get 16 stations in a thousand foot radius. So, but it, it doesn't apply this year. And then class D is the new one. And so if you're a home station, uh, you can be a, a one delta sugar victor. And maybe that's what I'll be, I'm not certain. Uh, I'll be on, probably on commercial power. I can also do battery power. So I'm debating, there's some point differences um, if you're on battery or you're on commercial power. And you may run across this on field day. Class E stations, uh, emergency power. I think some people use generators. That's what a class E station is. I think Bob was talking about doing that PGQ. And every now and then you'll hear this emergency operations center. So there is a special, uh, it's a housed building that's set up for emergency operations. And uh, I guess in, in the event of, uh, I don't know, hurricane, whatever. So they have locations. And if you get that, that's also a rare one. I don't think I've ever worked anybody on field day yet that was an emergency, so a class F um, designation. So those are the ones that uh, haven't changed. The class D's are gonna be participating more this year though. So the scoring, uh, phone contacts um, count as one point. Basically, you're, you're, hopefully you're using some kind of software that'll take care of all adding all this stuff up. If you do a CW contact, they're worth two points. So every single QSO you have, if you're doing CW, you're getting twice as many as the people that are talking on their, with their, their voice. And uh, the other interesting thing is digital contacts are also counted as two points. Kevin used FT8 last year and uh, was working 15 meters. So every time he made a contact, we got two points like it was CW. And I think actually we did work CW at the end, but it was kind of an afterthought at the end on 20 meters. Now the maximum points, uh, well, each, you, you get a point, uh, each time you work a state, it's, it's, a, it's a value of, of multiplier. And uh, you also get multipliers if you do it with less watts. So 
if you're five watts or less, your, your QSO total, whatever it's going to be, is times five. So it's, uh, it makes a bigger difference it makes, uh, if you're counting points. And as, as we're a N6NA River City Arcs team, your QRP stations are going to add points if they can make a lot of contacts. And uh, now it drops if you're five watts and you're using commercial power down to two. So if you're going to be plugged in and running five watts, maybe you want to go up to 150 watts because it's also worth a multiplier of two. Now, if you really go full guns, you're one delta and you want to use your amp, you're, lose, you're losing out on your multiplier. You're basically no multiplier. You're times one. So uh, uh, those people, you may be here making a ton of contacts and working really hard, but you're not doing as well as everybody else that's doing the twos and the five multipliers. Just, just a heads up. So maybe you want to run 100 watts or less. I don't know. If you're, really, if you're not getting any contacts, do what you need to do. Uh, Let's see, oh, if you're 100% emergency power, which is the case for running battery on our normal field day, you get 100 points per transmitter. And there were some other rules that I, I started putting in. I go, well, we're not, we're not public, but if you, if you uh, notify in a newspaper or in some way you get a media multiplier of 100 and various public um, uh, um, presentations, you can get some points. And so I just kind of skipped that because I didn't think um, we're that organized so we weren't gonna get much points in that area. But if you do contact your local congressman and you, are a, you have a safety person and all those things um, and have a banner um, and, you, and you're out in the field somewhere, you can get a lot of points. That's all worthwhile. But I just didn't list them. It's all a part of the uh, website that I started at the beginning. And then uh, this is the part where Kevin and I were playing this weekend. We are computer people, and if you're an internet enabled, uh, this will be useful for you. Um, otherwise, you have to save all your data on your computer wherever you are, and then somehow upload it after the fact in a place where you do have internet. Uh, the difference this year is we normally run the N3FJP field day software uh, for the club. And, uh, and it was so everybody that had a computer for logging, it was kind of free because we only somebody already paid the $8.99 uh, and we used it for the group. But this year, if you're using the uh, N3FJP software and it's a, it's a nominal fee of $8.99, you can use it for your family if you have more than one uh, person that operates in, inside your, uh, your house or wherever you're working. So the family is still $8.99 for the family. Otherwise, individually, it's a, a, a nominal stipend, which is just basically to support the ham that created the software, who happens to be, you know, secret code here, N3FJP. Um, Kevin and I were thinking, and, and others were thinking, how do we communicate as a team if we have internet and back and forth? And we thought, oh, Zoom might work, but um, discovered that, um, Others had suggested uh, that uh, there is a, a chat program called discord.com. And uh, Kevin and I have tried that out and it looks pretty impressive. You can do video chat if you want, uh, certainly text back and forth, voice chat. You can present images, say if you're, if you're bragging and saying you're showing your map and you filled it all out, you can send it to the group. Uh, so um, if you have internet, check out uh, as a team discord.com. Um, also, um, we were trying to figure out how do we, in real time, combine all our scores at once. And so there is a, I did contact a local contesting, the Motherload um, um, DX Club, and uh, he suggested that he uses N3FJP for all his logging, and they do use contest logging. And so there is a website that's um, managed by ICOM. Uh, it's called contestonlinescore.com, and it gives you real-time scoring, and you can kind of group it for N6NA or River City Arcs and see everybody's score live. If, if you're internet connected, uh, the software will automatically uh, upload 
every three minutes. So you have a running total and you can see that Bob is killing it up there in uh, Roosevelt or, or whoever's doing really well. And it's kind of, so those are ideas of how to be a team and not be present and uh, alive and seeing people um, that a normal field day provides. And uh, another thought was, you know, we saw pizza tonight. We were thinking that uh, our dinner for all our remote people, um, why not get pizza takeout? That would be fine for, for a field dinner. Maybe we can eat in front of, in front of the screen. I don't know. We can chat <laughs> and, break, and break from the radius. <laughs> and let's see, uh, software logging continued. Uh, we, we promote getting, getting on and participating. If you need paper logs as individuals, go ahead and do that. Uh, somebody has to type it in eventually to get it all logged in together, but paper logs are still good. And uh, definitely, you can't rely on batteries to last forever. One nice thing about our field day locations have been that we could always plug the computers in and they would run for the 24 hours. And certainly from home, that would be the case. Let's see if I can continue here. I wanted to talk a little bit more about this contest online scoring.com. I didn't know anything about it. Uh, they use it for a lot of contests that work as a team. So these uh, DX clubs use this quite a bit. And then I, I had to ask, since we're not a DX club, I had to ask that we, they add River City Arcs as a choice. So when you uh, get on uh, the website and uh, contestonlinescoring.com, log in with your call sign, create yourself a password. Uh, you can choose River City Arcs now if you, if you would do so. And, uh, and uh, for logging software, there is an, they have some built-in help on that website to connect your logging software. And I have a list a little farther down of the software that does work with this website and would work kind of nice. And farther down on the bullet points, um, the HTTPS discord.gg blah, blah, blah. That is discord.com, but it's, it, if you click that link, I don't know. Oh, basically, these notes are going to be placed up on the website, so um, you can either jot it down now or, or we can send it via email on a later time. Uh, it'll take you right to our group N6NA chat, chat area on this chatting program, and you will not see anybody else other than us. So um, Kevin and I tried that out. I think it worked just clicking that particular ugly URL worked. It's nicer just to send it an email and have you click it and ignore having to type that. The contest logging software that, I, that does work with this um, contest logging software, uh, WinTest, when I'm not familiar, N1MM, that's something that Kevin is thinking of using for FT8 logging because last year he had a lot of trouble logging with uh, our normal field day logging software, digital stuff. So um, I think he's probably going to use N1 MM plus or something like that. <clears throat> As you look down the list, write log, I'm not familiar. DX log, I'm not familiar. TR 4W and TR, apparently those are popular because they're two different versions of the same software. UCX log, QAR test, and 3FJP, which is I am familiar with for field day, we've used it. And RUM log, that's actually something that I, that's for Max that I actually use for my own, my own computers. And so I said, oh, that's kind of cool. RUM log is supported and that's something I use every day. So we would like you to participate and get on the air and have fun. We will have, I think we will have a breakout Zoom meeting to go over the details of how to get this software working because I cannot imagine that we would successfully get this all working on the day of field day. So we'd like to get it set up ahead of time and working and uh, walk through any problems that anybody's having. So I was thinking that we would use our normal N6NA uh, or email contact. If you're interested in participating, you have internet access and you want to give this a try. So I think the e email is correct. Contacts at N6NA.org. Go ahead and email that. I think Carol will forward it and we will get everybody together and probably do a follow on Zoom meeting. I was guessing it would be Tuesday, June 9th, which is next, next Tuesday, same bat time, bat channel, but we can uh, email back and forth to get it all nailed down if, if we're actually going to have it. 
But uh, so I'd like to hear if you're interested in, and if you have internet access for field day, your Wi-Fi works in your backyard or how you're gonna do it, and, or how you're gonna do it for that matter. So you can describe how you're gonna participate. That's all good, even if you don't wanna be in the Zoom meeting. And that's what I've got. Any, any questions or comments? Sounds, sounds quiet. I noticed Carol joined the Discord already. That, that's a good point, though. It doesn't need to be started and stopped. That the, the room that Tom set up, it's just there ready to be used. So if anyone wants to log on with that link, and you can chat with anyone that joins, and we'll, we'll use that over the field day weekend. Yeah, I sent the uh, slides to Carol. I think it's going to be in the archive. If, and so definitely you can get through the notes and not have to type that stuff. You can just click it. Uh, I don't know if everybody's going to be internet enabled. You don't. Have to. Yes. There was a question. Oh, that was a digital artifact. Okay. Well, thanks. I can unshare. Um, yeah, there was a couple of designations. Uh, you're breaking up for me. I, I did not get the question. Just about make it out. Uh, I can get rid of my screen if we're, we, we don't need it anymore and unshare. Let me try it again. And try to chat. Because that's Marty talking. Okay. It looks like it might be a bandwidth issue. If you can type it in the chat window, I'll, we'll get it down there. And look like so there was a designation for a home station. Yeah, the designator for home is, is on your normal radio is a delta, and if it's just you, it's one delta. That's the downside of, uh, of digital uh, <laughs> uh, communications over the internet. Hopefully, uh, we we have good luck if we do feel good also. Any other questions? Did, did we get it written in the chat? Let's see. No. All right, back to you, Kevin. Okay, thanks, Tom. Um, we we did want to ask if anyone wanted to have like a, a pre-field day Zoom meeting. If anyone's interested, they could let us know. Um, we could do it like the weekend before or whatever's going to work for people. If people want to like get together and test their setups or whatever, they can let us know. You know, it might be a good idea just to schedule it anyway, Kevin. Sure. Okay. Um, because, you know, it's going to crop up and there will be people at the last minute who do decide they like to participate. So by having a pre-schedule, I think it'll go a long way to solving some issues. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We can set that up. So who's planning to operate from home at the weekend or for the field day weekend? Right. Awful lot of players. Carol's in the game. Yeah. Yeah, I'll be operating CW. There's a big point there. counter. <laughs> We're also getting it in chat notes, Kevin, so we'll have to pay attention to that. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'll take a copy and then hold on to them. So, Carol, who are you going to throw your points in with? Uh, River City Arcs, of course. <laughs> Excellent. Do we know what any of the other clubs are doing? Does anyone know? Actually, I did see some, um, when I was Google searching, I did catch some other sites, but I didn't get a chance to look at them because I was only throwing this stuff today. Uh, I, I do want to go in and click through and see what they're up to. I. One site I did find, I clicked through and they just basically had a one paragraph saying we're going to do field day and, and, and they were going to have a meeting on it. So it wasn't that detailed. The, uh, the SFM Morse Club's meeting is this Thursday night and I'm sure they've got some announcements to that effect. Okay. Yeah, I know, even though things are going to be different, it might turn out to be pretty good because if you think all the different people that turn up at all the different club sites, if you take all those people and let's say most of them operate from home, 
that means there could be like a huge amount of people on operating for the weekend. So it could turn out to be pretty good. Not only that, potty breaks will be easier at home than they are at the uh, field day site. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I, we finally get a potty this coming and we don't get to use it. <laughs> I'm going to recreate the full uh, experience and put a bucket out in the back somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, yeah Hank sure and I will go it. out to our trailer, right? Yeah, I'm sure the families would appreciate that approach. <laughs> I'd like to see photos on the share, that's for sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> awesome. Right. Marty did get his question on there, and, and uh, Bob already answered it. So if your emergency power you're using a generator is classy, I think that's how Bob is actually going to run, too. So that's how he will be. Maybe a one out echo or some from his place. I have a general question on uh, using Zoom. Uh, just wondering if anybody knows the best way to uh, uh, transmit the video with audio without stuttering. I think it just depends on your bandwidth. Perhaps a smaller screen size may help on the video. I don't know. The, the, the chopping of audio is just a bandwidth problem. Yeah. That, okay, I have good uh, good one in here. And the other thing is that uh, looks like by looking at the way things went today, it looks like when we do the the show my shack, we may uh, may recommend use the speaker view that uh, would work better because sharing the screen and versus seeing the face on the same side. Okay, that's good. But thanks. Okay. You know something I did for share shack is I actually took some photos and I put them in a small uh, PowerPoint presentation so I can click through them. There's only seven of them. But you get a much better look at things with a photo than you do with the Zoom camera. And it kind of keeps you on task too. So it's something you may wish to consider. Did we finalize a date for that? When we're gonna do the show your shack? I, introduced, uh, I understood it was going to be the next general meeting. And I have not sent an email out, apologies. I will put an email out. I don't have my notes. I will tell you that uh, Larry has uh, volunteered. In fact, I think I sent a note out for that. Larry has volunteered to be our November speaker. Mm, okay. He's very good with trees. Ah, uh, this is the palm tree antenna. And an aim, I suppose. What's that? And good aim, because if you miss the palm tree, you got to start over. I, I think he had some experience with aim. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <sighs> All right. What else we got, boss? That's it, that's all our content. Do you have any other comments or anything from anybody before we wrap up? I did read in the news today that the backside of the sun's been experiencing some explosions. So maybe we're into a new sunspot activity realm. Hmm. Probably due to that new rocket up there that came up aboard a Tesla. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to uh, seeing the uh, first part of the meeting when it's posted on YouTube. Unfortunately, I had computer troubles and that's why I missed out the first part. Yeah, we'll get it uploaded like we have done for the other one. So uh, I'll work on that. Well, good night, guys. Thank you. Good presentation. Good meeting. See you next time. All right. Take have care, everybody. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, Good night. We'll get the nest tomorrow. Thanks. Would you click to post Thanks. something in the chat? Uh, just press enter, return, I think. Yeah, on the bottom is a type of message here. Maybe that's what you're yeah. I did that part. And hit enter, it should just enter. Yeah, press enter. After you write, press enter. Yeah. It's not working? 
Oh, okay, finally. There you go. Okay. There you go. Hi, Greg. Yeah. I got your, I got your letter, Greg. Mm. Okay, got we've got right. it. <laughs> Very good. Oh, well. Any last minute uh, comments on your handy talkies? If you paste them in now, I'll take a copy and then we'll, we'll collect together that list. Yeah, because you can just save the list. Yeah. So. That's what I was doing was adding it in. <laughs> Paul? So, Carol, do I need more power or do I need to put up a real antenna or both? For QRP. No, for the net. Oh, I see. For the handy talkie? Yeah. Uh, describe your problem, Kathy. Yeah. Sylvia. I don't know that you've. Ever Nobody's heard. heard me the last five weeks. Do you have one of those J poles that we built with? Uh, I do. And it's now helping you? I haven't put it up. Try it. Because <laughs> my <laughs> handy okay. talkie wouldn't work, and I put that thing on, it was like magic. All right. There you go. I'll do that. I think the problem right now is that the repeater is in hilltop mode. The remote receivers are offline. So there's only one receiver up in uh, Shingle Springs. Uh, and it makes it really hard for the low power handheld videos to get in, unless you have an outside antenna. Good. Actually, that's a good point. Uh, we did have some information that on the weekend it was going to be uh, worked on. So certainly on Saturday and Sunday, people may have had problems because it was being worked on uh, for that weekend. That was Andy's 440, right? I think. Right. Oh, that's true. It was only one of the one of the bands. Yeah, it was the 440 that he was going to take down, but. <laughs> All right, 73. All right. Have a good weekend. All right, have a good one, everybody. We'll catch up with you later. Okay. Thank you all. All right. Bye. Goodbye. Okay. Bye. Bye bye. Have a good evening, everybody. Good night. Good night.